Um, hi, everybody. In my role as, um, as Earth Archive Regional Coordinator, I would like to introduce you to one of the most fascinating regions of the Amazon. The Llanos de Mojos is located in Bolivia and is part of the southwestern Amazon basin. This region is one of the largest seasonal flooded savanna in the world, and it covers approximately 130,000 square kilometers. Surrounded by the Andes and the uplands of the Brazilian Shield, this area is significant in discussions about movements of groups and cultural interactions, particularly between the pre-Hispanic settlements in lowland South America and the Andes. The Madera Basin is particularly, and particularly the Llanos de Mojos, is home of the highest concentration of isolated indigenous language in the world. The Beni Plains concentrate half of the 36 indigenous people recognized by the political constitution of the plurinational state of Bolivia, seven of which belongs to isolated and unique language families. Um, these mounds have a monumental architecture with evidence constructive and functional patterns. For example, the center of the Loma Salvatierra site is formed by a low artificial terraces lying in an oxbow of a Palio River. The major platform building, uh, rising to the highest of seven, seven meters, and some lower platform were built on these terraces. On top of the mound, low platforms are arranged in a U shape, enclosing a space that opens to the northwest. The site is delimited by a polygonal causeways running at a dis distance of an enclosing an area of 21 hectares. To the south are channels, ponds, and dikes, which were most probably used to regulate and or capture water from the savanna in the south. According to the radiocarbon date from our excavation at the Loma Salvatierra and nearby Loma Mendoza, both mounds were occupied between 600 and 1400 AD. A detailed analysis of the ceramic found uh, at the sites allow us to propose a fine ceramic chronology with clear stylistic ruptures around 1000 AD. Excavations on the top of the platform building reveal the complex stratigraphy. The ceramic found in these excavations unit was the high quality throughout the scan, all the sequence, indicating that the top of the mounds might have been reserved for a special purpose or, or was perhaps the residence of the litter. This pottery seems to have an emblematic function of prestige due to the selective dispersions. Dated around 600 AD, one of the most interesting burials was found in the center of the mound. It was the only one with metal objects. On the front side, there is a copper disc and intriguingly made personal adornments of bone and stones the bracelet here, uh, the four jaguar task. Uh, the individual man in his 30s also wore ear disc of Cooper, which round segments cut out of the armor of an armadillo on the opposite side. Mice and diversity of plants was documented at the site by the analysis of starch residues in the pottery and by burnt seeds. However, emergency evidence suggests that around 1,000, the people from Loma Salvatierra may even have abandoned agriculture and, revealed to a, and re reverted to a mixed subsistence economy. I will now briefly present another example of the monumentality. Northeast of the Llanos de Mojos, archaeological sites surrounded by ditches were documented. For the first time in 2012, the German Archaeological Institute applied LiDAR technology in the Amazon, and the results were more than revealing. Several trench systems were documented, both on the banks of the major river and associated with small permanent water courses. You can see all these 
fringe systems. The largest sites was around 200 hectares in size and most of the ditches were probably built between 1200 and 1400 AD, contemporaneous with other landscape mod modifications such as causeway, causeway canals, system and fish traps. Archaeological excavations documented some occupational features inside the ditch system, such as trash pits and burials. The mortuary contexts were composed by vessels which, with necks, which were intentionally cut to the deposit to no body or some bones of the person, which was later covered by other vessels or pieces of vessels. Finally, manufactured and elaborated decorated vessels were found inside of the burial. There are several ways to learn about the past. Archaeologists interpolate the past through objects, oral history of indigenous and local peoples, landscapes, plants, flavors, and cultural practices that we can still observe in the present of the indigenous people and that help us to understand the past. 45% of the Amazon region is made up of indigenous territories, showing the map in orange and natural protected areas in green. In recent years, the indigenous people of the Amazon have begun to actively reclaim the past for themselves. Archaeological sites and certainly materialities become part of their politics discourses leading to a reconsideration of the role of archaeology and the responsibilities of archaeologists toward the indigenous and traditional peoples who have a long been marginalized from academic discussions. The new law of land use for Beni Bolivia was approved in 2019, in which was decided that an area of more than 300,000 hectares would be deforested and dedicated to intensive agricult agricultural use, marked here in red, and that 5.5 million hectares would be dedicated to extensive agricultural use, marked here in yellow. The fight against the destruction of the Amazon is a war that can only be won in different, univer in different universities, research institutions, government and non-government organizations, as well as social organizations joint forces. Only by joint forces can we protect one of the most beautiful and biodiverse, biodiverse spaces that exist in our planet. Let's make it possible to apply it lighter in indigenous territories so that we can collaborate with the communities in their fight against extractivism. Thank you. Today I'd like to talk about the formulation of a research project. This is one that's been going on for decades. I'll focus on one part of it. So I'm a landscape archaeologist, very interested in historical ecology, the long-term human environment interaction that produce the biodiversity, the landscapes that we know today. And I study anthropogenic landscapes like this. These are what we call raised fields. I always wanted to know who built them, why did they build them, what did they use them for, why were they abandoned, and how were the societies organized? Well, we had to work with local communities to actually take abandoned agricultural systems, actually put them back into use, plant them with the crops that we can document were grown on them to see how they work. And are they sustainable? These are newly constructed raised fields on the top and then below, six months later when the rains come, wetlands, as we know, have incredible resources. One of the major resources we're most familiar with are fish for protein, which in many areas of the world, this is the way you got your protein, not from other animals. Today, wetlands, as we know, are under threat and considered to be something to get rid of. My hypothesis is that native peoples in Bolivia, but also in many other parts of the world, saw them as extremely attractive landscapes. The landscape is flooded for six months and then the floodwaters recede into the dry season, grassland savanna. This is during the rainy season. Uh, the floodwaters leave the rivers, heavy rainfall covers the landscape with a thin sheet of water in most places, except for where you see the tropical forest. Those are forest islands. 
You can see how dramatic these floods are from an image showing the high water mark on the trees with the mud and the low water mark at the middle of the dry season. Earthen causeways, and so these are essentially wide roadways that go from forest island, where communities were and gardens, to other forest islands. To build them, they had to t excavate earth, and they piled it up to make the causeway, creating a canal or two canals. In looking at thousands of aerial photographs, satellite imagery, and Google Earth, stains of brown that show interesting patterns. So you see two large causeways here, and the terrain gradually slopes. It's almost flat, but it slopes a little bit from the right to the left. And you can see that something is going on right-hand side of these features. They still maintain a function of possibly controlling water. In the scenes of here, the forest islands show up as bright green, and you see the stain here in the middle, water that's backed up and stagnant. This is a schematic of how we people the past and visualize it to show what this landscape would have been like of people on the causeway and then using the canoes to move people and goods across this landscape. And the landscape here is almost completely flat, but not completely flat. And so here you see a forest island in the background, one of the local rivers, and then this sort of gentle slope that goes up from the low areas to the high ground. And so this will gradually fill the, all the way to the trees and the water will recede. So this is a cycle that has all kinds of environmental impact on the chemistry of soils, productivity, and biodiversity. In a cross-section of a typical causeway, you can see one here. They were much higher in the past because they badly eroded today, and the canals wouldn't be filled with sediments, but they'd be much deeper. You can get a sense here of how monumental these features are, and there are thousands and thousands of these crisscrossing the landscape. One hypothesis that we have is that causeways connecting high ground to high ground with this gentle slope in the early rainy season it would capture early rains behind this essentially earthen wall, less than a meter in most cases, at the height of the wet season, completely covered, and it gradually drains off, but it still holds water longer than it normally would into the dry season. But we could never actually convincingly prove it. So working with a number of colleagues that are remote sensing specialists and GIS specialists, I proposed a project to NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, for their space archaeology program. And we received a generous three-year grant from them. We tried every possible image we could get hold of, different radar images, satellite images, and old aerial photographs. All of the work seemed to be going nowhere because the resolution was not at the scale that we needed for testing these things, especially in terms of digital elevation models to look at simulated water flow on the landscape itself. Jed Dale, the guy in the bottom there, approached me as an undergraduate. I hired him immediately as an intern because I could see that he could help me solve my problem. So most of the work that I'm showing here is actually his work contributing to the project. In some of our early data, we used radar imagery and radar can be very sensitive to the presence and absence of water on the landscape. And we're interested in linear patterns. So you can see some linear patterns here. And a little bit later in the season, using different imagery from different months. And then if we vectorize our causeways there, you can see that there is a mild effect, especially in the center of the image, of possibly water being backed up. Now, our main problem was that all of our models that we use for this work, they leak because of the tree cover, which distorts the digital elevation model, so it's not actually the true surface. And to run hydraulic models, you've got to have a good model of the actual surface that you're going to actually flood and try to simulate the movement of water. So we came up with the idea that we would model the landscape after much cleanup of our very messy digital elevation models to actually get a convincing terrain surface, Jed decided to apply two models. So one we call the natural landscape model. So this is the landscape without the earthworks, without the causeway. And then we can run 
simulation after simulation of dumping water on this landscape to see what happens to it. This is one iteration, and then when you run the model, this would be going through the season. You can see the serpentine patterns of where water is flowing. Throughout the year, it changes a little bit as the water gets deeper. This would be the height of the rainy season. You can see all the water beginning to back up as it can't get out of this landscape. Now, if we do what we call the anthropogenic landscape model, so this is actually with artificial causeways raised up to their, what we think is original height, connecting high ground to high ground. Running the model again, we see incredible changes, especially down on the lower left and the middle part that was all darkened early in the other model is not through the season, a little bit more than the height of the season. You can see water is now blocked, but how is it blocked? It's blocked mainly behind some of those causeways. Conclusions, we wanted to find out not only where water goes and whether these pre-Columbian engineers could control water, but we wanted to know how much water. We could actually calculate the volume in cubic meters of water that we backed up behind any one of these causeways that created by the peoples of the past. Here's looking at two of these causeways that frame an artificial reservoir of, in a sense, a 30 centimeter flood, which is not much in this area. They would have contained six million cubic meters of water. And then with a meter high flood, with a slightly higher causeway, it would back up 50 million cubic meters of water. This is only one small part of a vast landscape. So these peoples were doing complex water management using engineering techniques that probably many societies didn't develop until much later in history to sustain large populations in this area, a stateless society, and had a very active social life using the same water features as means of social interaction between communities spread out over this landscape. But to me, this is an application of applied archaeology, where archaeology can actually reverse engineer pre-Columbian knowledge and make it available to the peoples of the area. There's a great sense of pride in what Native peoples did in Bolivia and Peru and other countries in Latin America. Peoples of the past completely transformed their landscapes, and not in the traditional interpretation that everything humans do is destructive. Yes, they were changing biodiversity, doing things to it, but these are some of the highest biodiverse areas in the country of Bolivia. So they were doing something right. Good morning. My name is John Walker. Uh, I am talking to you from the University of Central Florida in Orlando. And I want to tell you about landscape archaeology along the Iruyanyas River. And I want to make it clear that I am speaking uh, with the help of so many people in Santana del Yacuma, Trinidad, La Paz, Bolivia, um, with the help of so many institutions and so many people uh, in Eastern Bolivia and around the world. So the landscape I want to describe to you is an Amazonian landscape, and yet it's also a constructed landscape or an agricultural landscape. This is a seasonally flooded savanna in Eastern Bolivia that really in places is covered by agricultural fields. They are about 20 meters wide. They're well over uh, hundreds of meters long in some cases. Uh, and this is one case in the Amazon out of, out of many. I think the specificity of this case is important because the Amazon is huge. The Amazon is as large as the continental United States. And this particular place in the um, lowlands of Eastern Bolivia, part of the Madeira River drainage, presents a really specific uh, a sort of aspect. The first 
uh, thing that I want to tell you about are those raised fields where the difference of only a few centimeters makes a really important distinction and really changes soil conditions. Now, of course, we think that pre-Columbian peoples built these fields in order to improve those soils for agriculture. We've mapped now about 44,000 of these fields. So that's the first thing that draws our attention to this place. The second thing are forest islands, areas where the ground is a little bit higher, maybe a meter, two meters higher, and three out of every four of these forest islands show direct evidence of pre-Columbian habitation, broken pottery, and sometimes earthworks that are underneath the forest, very difficult to see with conventional photography, but possible to make out if you use LIDAR. So here underneath one of those islands is a ring ditch, a circular ditch that goes around the entire island. And if you look closely, you can see in this excavation some of the broken pottery that's accumulated in the dark soil in the bottom of that ring ditch. So in a lot of these excavations, we're trying to recover that, the, that pottery and place it in a larger context, connect it out to the earthworks that we see in other places. Sometimes in excavation, we find really remarkable things like this fish. This fish came out of an excavation in one of those pre-Columbian ring ditches. So the point that we want to make from this is that the decisions that pre-Columbian peoples made in the past to build that construction, to build that ring ditch, had consequences for the plants, animals, and people living in the area today. Of course, sometimes those decisions are pretty easy to understand as being related to agriculture. Here are some of the plants that we've recovered, including a sort of familiar plants like sweet potato, or corn, but also some crops that maybe are not so familiar, like uh, uh, ice cream bean, or achiote, or uh, ilex. So a really spectacular variety of plants, uh, we believe, were used in agriculture. So our recent efforts are attempting to recover soils and reconstruct some of that long-term history. Here we're using a machine called a vibracorer to extract sediment from a swamp. And the important part about this swamp is that it's close to agricultural fields, those large raised fields, and it's close to those forest islands. So if we can retrieve a column of soil from this swamp, this particular swamp, uh, it'll look something like this. Here are the dark organic soils on the left hand side of the photograph and then the heavy clay soils you see on the right have a lot of yellows and reds from uh, uh, minerals uh, that are brought up by the water and then the water leaves them behind when it goes down in the dry season that seasonality is absolutely important uh, in this part of the world so my colleague uh, neil duncan uh, can take those soils process them and from each slice recover another chapter in the environmental history of this place by looking at microscopic remains, charcoal, pollen, phytoliths, and diatoms, things that allow us to reconstruct the environment over thousands of years. So our goal in our most recent stage of research has been to take two of those cores, cores that are in the middle of a of an anthropogenic landscape, a landscape that is covered with those uh, raised fields and also with those forest islands. So this context means that those cores might tell us something about the people who changed the landscape in that way. And the cores tell a similar story, but at two different times. At about In this example, at about 1700 BCE, a great deal of charcoal comes into the profile, a change happens in the phytoliths, and pollen and diatoms uh, begin to be preserved. That beginning of preservation, we interpret as a, a hydrological change where people are manipulating water to conserve it in this particular place. A very similar story comes out in the other core, except that it's almost 2,000 years later. At about 200 CE, the same pattern, lots of charcoal, a change in phytoliths, and the emergence of pollen and diatoms in our record. So we interpret this as being strong evidence for human manipulation of the environment because those two cores are located only about 22 kilometers apart. So here's a satellite image that shows the Omi River to the north, 
a small tributary river, the Yakuma River to the south. This long permanent wetland is sort of swampy band there in the middle. And these two cores, the Kinato core and the Mercedes core, showing that similar story, but almost 2000 years apart and only about 22 kilometers between them. It's also very flat, right? So we understand this to mean that the most likely reason for this difference is the engineering that humans put into the landscape. In this image, in a sort of middle distance, you can see a sort of a zigzag pattern or a zipper kind of a pattern. Those are large raised fields that really only become visible. They've really only become visible in the past few years. Um, and the, uh, the changes in moisture make them visible. Here's three of my Bolivian colleagues, Andrea Cruz, Mabel Ramos, and Lisette Duran, carrying out an excavation in that forest island we just saw in order to recover ceramics and use radiocarbon dating to place them in a chronological context that we can then connect up to that environmental record. Um, so when we take that uh, uh, archaeological um, evidence, there's one last piece of it of landscape evidence I want us to consider. There's that forest island on the left, another piece of high ground on the right, and there's a sort of a wiggly line in the middle that seems to divide two different colors in the imagery. We, we can see that on remote sensing imagery, and when we go there on the ground, what we find is that the wiggly line on the imagery turns out to exist on the ground as well. And when you walk on that sort of a uh, light green line that I hope you can see in this image, your feet stay dry. Whereas if you step off a meter or two to either side, your feet get wet. So we interpret this uh, through analogy with some of the things you saw in Dr. Erickson's talk as a fish weir or a causeway that may have a role in controlling water and therefore controlling populations of fish. So in this location, which is a little different, we see uh, a gallery forest, a forest that floods every year alongside of a river, um, a forest island next to that, those raised areas that have a sort of a distinct vegetation and three out of four of them show evidence of people living there, raised fields out in the savanna, and then these zigzag features or causeways that sort of in many cases seem to run between areas of high ground. So when the landscape shifts from being a wet season landscape back to being a dry season landscape, the water flows back into the rivers. And at least sometimes we think these causeways are lying across that water, which allows that water to be controlled and perhaps fish to be controlled as well. So the landscape really is, in many ways, the heritage of pre-Columbian peoples, whether it's habitation of the forest islands, construction and use of raised fields, or the use of causeways to manipulate water. We cannot understand the Amazon in the past except as that heritage. And we need that knowledge to understand the Amazon in the present and to plan for the future. Thank you very much. I'm Umberto Lombardo. I'm, I work at Penn University, I'm a geographer, and I spend all my scientific career working in the Bolivian Amazon. Now I'm going to talk about, about monumental mounds and their relation with rivers in the Bolivian Amazon. So this is where we are. This is the, the southwestern Amazonia that is mostly covered by seasonally flat savanna, which is called Bildão de Mojos. This is roughly 100,000 square kilometers of seasonally flat savanna. Is all this yellowish area here. This landscape is characterized by Palio rivers. So here you see a Palio channel that is going like this. And then you have forest on both sides of this Palio channel. This forest grows on the levees. And then when you go far away from the Palio channel, you get into the savanna, which is the former back swamp of this river. So mostly of the landscape in the Olimocos is as this kind of setting of seasonal flood savannas crisscrossed by stripes of forest that grows along value channels. So here you have the digital elevation model of all the other mojos and you see that the area is almost completely flat. So the average slope here is about 10 centimeters every kilometer. This 
white stripes here. This represents paleo um, courses, paleo directions of the Grande River, the Rio Grande. This is the modern course, but in former times it was flowing to the north and then it shifted counterclockwise towards this modern um, position here. This area, 60 by 70 kilometers, is the Monumental Mound region. This is the area where years ago I mapped more than 100 monumental mounds inside. And this area is at the, at the top of one of these branches of the Rio Grande. So what are these monumental mounds? Here you have uh, again a digital elevation model of one of these mounds. This is the Mount Loma Salvatierra. And to get an idea of the size, this here, this rectangle is a football field. It's 50 by 100 meters, half an hectare. So this mound, this is an average to small mound. It's several times the size of a football field. And all this greenish area here, it's about three to four meters above the ground, the, the, the original surface on which the mound was built. And this pyramid here, this, this peak reaches nine meters. So we are talking about thousands and thousands of cubic meters of earth that have been moved to build this mound. And this mound are associated to other structure, other earthworks like polygonal causeways, canals, water reservoirs, and other things that make a complex system built around these monumental mounds. What is interesting is that these mounds are built along paleo channels. So this is one of the paleo channels and the mound is built in the inner side of the meander. So in this picture, this would be in this place. Now, let's have a look at the more detail at the river system in the monumental mound region. So the water was flowing from the south east to the northwest and the river in this place, it formed something like an interior delta. So it went through a lot of evolutions, so changes of course. And so it, it built this distributive system made of a lot of paleo channels and it deposited a lot of sediments. Now, when we look at the distribution of the monumental mounds, we see that almost all of them are built along these paleo channels. And here you have an histogram of the sites. So the average mound is between five and six hectares and the largest is more than 20 hectares in surface. So these are really monumental structures that are being built along all these pilot channels. But apart from the, the monumental mounds, we also have hundreds of kilometers of canals and causeways that have been built partly to connect all the mounds among them. So building uh, infrastructure of communication uh, among all these mounds, but also there are, some of them are drainage canal that have been built for uh, agricultural purpose. And how this it work, we see now um, the digital elevation model. It, this is a smooth elevation model. So I removed all the noise due to vegetation of the monumental mound region. And we see that this is a sedimentary lobe. It's relatively better drained than the rest of the Llano Mojos. So basically between the center of the sedimentary lobe and its border, we have about four to five meter of difference in elevation. So that makes this area two to three times better drained than the rest of the Llano Mojos. But people had to take advantage of this uh, natural slope by building drainage canals. And here we see them. So in this area, this is an example of these uh, pink lines here are drainage canals. These are draining the savanna towards this river here. So the construction of all these drainage canals made the, the, the duration of this seasonal flood shorter and increased the time during which maize and probably other crops could be cultivated in the savanna. So we have uh, plenty of evidence that this society was relying for good part of, of the time during which people were living there, was relying on maize. They even fed maize to ducks. 
and of course they had to produce surpluses in order to finance the, the, the complexity of the society, the hierarchies, etc. So we are in front of a landscape engineering of huge scale and that makes this area probably among the most interesting in Amazonia from an archaeological point of view. So how long it took to survey all these mounds? It took to me six months of field work during two years to just get to this mound, take a GPS point and get a rough idea of the size of the mounds. But if we had a LiDAR coverage, we could have mapped all this mound in far less time. And not only we had, we would have had the, the location of the mounds, but we would have also the digital elevation model of each of the mound. So allowing us to look at architectural patterns across different mounds, but it will also allow us to explore the surrounding of the monumental mound region. And in particular, this area here that is all forested, this is Monte San Pablo, this forest area, where I surveyed just this little spot and I found three monumental mounds also built in this forested area. And people told me there are many more mounds deep in the forest. And these are really difficult to, to, to survey by foot, as I did here, because it's far easier to move across savannas than to move into the forest. And a LIDAR would spot all the mounds that are here. This is also an urgent thing to do, because as you see here in the north, deforestation is increasing. This is illegal deforestation that is done with caterpillars that basically destroy everything. So all these small earthworks like canals and causeway, they get erased for, for, from the landscape. So it's very important that we can survey and map all these features before they are destroyed. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Samaipata was one of the easternmost advanced facilities that the Inca Empire established in the eastern Bolivian tropics. It's inscribed in the UNESCO's heritage list, and nearby is the Amboro National Reserve. Located along an ancient interecological trading route, the region was multi-ethnic. This included the Guarani, Arawak-speaking groups, and other cultures known as the Mohokoya and Yampara, among others. The project aims to understand the ancient population dynamics and the changes prompted by the Incas at its arrival using a long-term perspective. It also seeks to understand the ways in which current environmental crisis and political instability are affecting the conservation of this unique site. One of such threats were the devastating fires that swept over most of Amazonia and other tropical regions of South America. Samaipata and the adjacent regions were part of these tragic events fueled by a number of environmental, sociopolitical, and anthropogenic factors yet to be explored. Considering the importance of Samaipata as a UNESCO site and the threat that such fires represent to its conservation, this presentation is dedicated to exploring the factors uh, behind uh, such effects and the complex interaction between increased global warming, indigenous territorial displacement, and state policies. As you can see, Samaipata is located in the tropical mountains before the savannas of Santa Cruz. Nearby to the south is the Amboró National Park, the Llanos de Beni or Mojos, and to the east, the Chiquitania and El Pantanal savannas. To the west, are the subtropical dry mountains and valleys of Santa Cruz, and to the southeast is the drier Chaco forest suitable for slash and burn farming. This is a view of the site based on a map we produced recently using a drone. It shows some of the excavations done in the 1990s by Albert Mayers. A close-up of the carved rock which is one of the large Ushnu ritual platforms of the Inca Empire. It's filled with complex iconography, including carved snakes, pumas, 
geometric motifs, elegant niches, and zigzagging walls. A few years ago, uh, Professor Shokulski and his team have documented its iconography and deterioration level. Considering COVID-19, travel restrictions, and the fact that we could not do archaeological research last year, we gathered longitudinal information on forest fire events. We also examined the material culture from excavations in the 1990s housed at a local museum and analyzed VIRRA satellite images with a resolution of 375 meters per pixel that was useful to document satellite-derived fire events. This specific sensor is used since 2008, which allowed us to document the last 12 years of fire history in Bolivia until last year uh, of 2020. To ease data comparison, we use the smallest provincial section polygons available in Bolivia. Then we counted the number of fire events for each section polygon and compiled the information in three categories. Low intensity fires, up to 0.5 fires per square mile. Medium intensity fires, up to one fire per square mile high intensity fires up to 1.5 fires per square mile. Values uh, beyond this scale were classified as extremely intense fires. This facilitated regional comparison uh, as well as changes over time. As you can see, the sequence of maps reveals important trends. First, and as elsewhere, the effects of increased global warming and decrease in rainfall patterns are evident. These trends increased with some expected fluctuations. Um, years 2010, 2015, and 2019 were especially difficult as medium intensity fires spread out over most of the tropics. In San Maipata, years 2018 until 2020, were especially difficult in adjacent drier Chaco forests as high and extremely higher intense fires spread out. However, there are also political and economic factors at play. This relates to national policies favoring deforestation, highland colonization, and the reallocation of land for industry. For example, in 2015, Bolivian President Evo Morales approved Law 741 that authorizes the use of fires in forested areas up to 20 hectares. This law had a dramatic effect on indigenous land often owned collectively. As a result, extremely intense places in the next two years run through the main road in southwestern Amazonia and Brazil uh, the, there were a set of indigenous protests, but the law was implemented. Similarly, National Decree 3973 of 2019 had the goal of expanding deforestation in favor of colonization and agroindustry, such as sugar, cane, and soy. Morales also planned to increase the allocation of land for cattle he had signed an agreement with China to export beef. The effects were clear. That year and in 2020, two extremely high fire corridors crossed the tropics. The first ran through the transnational road to Brazil to the east, affecting the Chaco and the humid Pantanal ecologies. Initially built to transfer gas, this road is also critical to move exports and to facilitate the penetration into indigenous lands. The second place corridor ran uh, through the road to Beni. Luckily, there was a relative decline last year due to harsh indigenous protests, COVID-19 pandemics, and the government elections. However, the effects of this national decree remain to be seen. In this context, the Pre-Columbian Inca center of Samaipata is also part of this dramatic 
events. As a UNESCO site, it sits in an ecological intersection. To the south is the Amboro National Reserve, and to the northeast, in the drier Chaco, as you can see, there are a number of indigenous Guarani territories or teseos. Although the region has a history of low and medium intensity fire regimes due to traditional farming sweden methods, there was a belt of extremely fire, high fire blazes between 2018 and 2020, if you recall. During this time, the archaeological site was also subject to recurrent dangerous fires. In part, this was due to the growing uh, political crisis, political vendettas, road blockages, and illegal land intrusion. In 2018, my team and I helplessly watched poorly equipped firemen battling against a several days lasting blaze at the site. Archaeology and historical ecology have shown that agroforestry and slash and burn agriculture are important strategies used by indigenous tropical groups in their agrarian regimes. Like in Amazon, these methods are effective in capturing carbon and in managing the forest. However, accelerated global warming, indigenous Guarani territorial displacement, and the colonization of the region for industrial ends have promoted a completely different scale of anthropogenic fires. It threatens its cultural and ecological diversity. In the future, we will continue exploring these trends. We hope to integrate LiDAR data in the next phase in order to document the architectural remains around the Inca center of Samaipata hidden by the thick, thick forest, as you, as you can see here, such as stone-built residences or agrarian terraces, uh, we plan to produce um, 3D reconstructions of the surrounding landscape and associated architecture. And we envision doing a set of spatial analysis to continue assessing fire regimes and changes in the environment. Thank you. In this presentation, we are going to show how a technology that was employed for discovering archaeological sites beneath the canopy forest could also be employed to help a Brazilian extractive reserve to create sustainable Amazonian futures. During our archaeological past project, we used LiDAR technology to detect archaeological sites below the forest in the state of Acre, Brazil in southwestern Amazonia. This is a region best known by the so-called geoglyphs, where, uh, where deforestation in the past four decades have exposed a massive ceremonial landscape of geometrically patterned ditch enclosures like the one we're seeing in the picture. You can, free, you can briefly see how we have used LiDAR technology to discover uh, archaeological sites. Here you can see a satellite image of the uh, Bonal municipality, uh, the LiDAR map of the 3D structure of the forest and the canopy, and once we apply the vegetation uh, removal uh, algorithm, we can see the ground and we are able to detect these two uh, geoglyphs. LiDAR mapping has also allowed us to reveal uh, very subtle architectural features of geoglyphs, just as all these rows that you see coming to these, to these circular geoglyphs and this uh, rectangular uh, enclosure, this rectangular annex seen in these pictures, and has also allowed us to uh, define the architectural features of this recently defined archaeological culture that we call the Circular Mound Village. And if you want to know everything about it, uh, you can read our paper, Geometry by Design. But uh, the Amazon is facing uh, a crisis, commercial interest, population growth, climate change, and reduced environmental regulations are threatening biodiversity, indigenous heritage, and community identity. Indigenous communities living in the Amazon are increasingly converting to cattle ranching and commercial slash and burn agriculture 
due to the potential economic rewards and lack of alternative economic pathways. This in turn has resulted in widespread deforestation and negative impact in community uh, identity. Therefore, developing sustainable land use practices and alternative solutions to destructive industries is crucial for protecting the Amazon forests and securing global uh, futures. We all know that this is of global uh, significance. Uh, the Amazon is a major reservoir of uh, biodiversity, is uh, crucial for the regulation of Earth climate, but also people is very uh, important. Over 90% of the world's poorest people depend on forest for their livelihoods and preserving the, their culture. We know that uh, forest areas that are protected by the residents suffer 11 times lower deforestation than surrounding areas. As much as 22% of the Brazilian Amazon is managed by forest residents, which represents 27% of the carbon stocks, and by 2050, about half of the world population will live in the tropics. And the Brazilian extractive reserves uh, play a major role uh, on, on this. Here are shown in the light green. They are protected areas established by the Brazilian government to preserve the biocultural heritage of the Amazon. And they are inhabited by traditional population whose livelihoods are primar primarily based on the extraction of non-timber products uh, from the forest, small scale fisheries, subsistence, small scale subsistence agriculture and small animal uh, breeding. The Kasumba uh, Irasema Extractive Reserve focus on the uh, processing of acai palm uh, berries. Here we can see the processing uh, plant, the seasonal exploitation of Brazil nut, uh, rubber tapping, and the selling of, uh, of crust. Well, when we started the project, we had meetings uh, with the community to see how we could use the LiDAR technology that was developed and used during the archaeological past project to suit their, their needs. And uh, we agreed after several meetings, as you can see, several communal meetings, we agreed on the following uh, objective. We wanted to create a detailed digital elevation model of the reserve to design uh, flood mitigation strategies and route planning, for example, to uh, get easier access to emergency service and the local uh, markets, to create 3D maps of the forest structure to identify new areas for the exploitation of non-timber forest products, in particular acai palm berries and Brazil nut, to create a carbon map of the reserve that precisely quantifies the carbon store in the forest, which in turn can be translated to carbon credits. And why not, since we are archaeologists, uh, find some archaeological sites which, may, which could have had some potential for what we call archaeotourism. This is the Kasumba Irasema uh, Reserve. This is a close-up of the transects that uh, were scanned for, for LiDAR. Here uh, you can see the, the LiDAR integration, how we integrated uh, our LiDAR sensor into a helicopter. Here you can see the system in, in action while we were uh, scanning uh, the forest. And now uh, take, let's take a look at the, at the products of this scanning. So here you can see the digital elevation model of the terrain and to our disappointment, no archaeological sites, no earthworks were uh, found uh, below the forest. However, using the LiDAR data, we were able to uh, calculate that the reserve that is about the size of uh, Devon County, where I live today in the city of Exeter, that is about 7,500 square kilometers uh, preserve around 100,000 tons of carbon 
that is uh, equivalent to uh, 5,145 uh, tanker, tanker trucks of uh, gasoline. And this is important because the precise calculation of carbon stocks has in turn been used in the negotiations to define the amount paid as an environmental service by the French Brazilian footwear uh, brand, Beja Bert, which is arranging to buy sustainable collected, sustainably collected rubber from 40 families in the reserve to create these uh, shoes. Also, uh, partnering with INPE, uh, we use LiDAR data to create algorithm to detect areas uh, with concentrations of trees of economic uh, importance. And this is the case, for example, of the algorithm that was created to detect acai palm. And then when it was applied here, you can see in the map that the red dots represent acai palms and then the uh, circles, major concentrations that uh, will allow for future exploitation of these uh, areas. Something uh, very similar, a similar exercise uh, was carried out to detect Brazil nut, which are emergent trees that are more than uh, 40 meters tall in the, in the forest that here are uh, represented by the blue dots. And crucially, all this uh, information will be used to expand the exploitation of acai palm berries and Brazil nuts once we recover from COVID. Well, I hope that in this uh, very brief presentation, we have been able to show how the use of LIDAR that can be collected uh, for an archaeological project can also be used for uh, community projects. The Amazon uh, and its traditional, this is very timely because the Amazon and its traditional communities under, are under increasing uh, pressure that has uh, local and global consequences. Amazonian traditional communities have been hit hard uh, by COVID and Kasumba Irasema is not an exception. Sadly, uh, Maria uh, Marilene, that we can see here in, in the picture, the manager of the reserve of only 35 years of age, uh, died of COVID uh, last uh, year. Overall, again, we hope that in this very brief presentation, uh, we have been able to showcase how projects like Futures and the Earth Archive um, are so needed to document uh, the, the biocultural heritage of uh, Amazonia and beyond across uh, the globe. Finally, I would like to, to thank the Kasumba Irasema community, all members of the project and the European Commission, Commission for funding this initiative. Thank you very much for your attention.